Thanks everybody. Thanks to Jana and the Career Center for having me. I really want to share with you some of the things I've learned in 20 years of entrepreneurship and some of the best practices that I've developed. Some of them are really about building a business, building a management team, and some of them are just about life and living life well. And I call this talk The Conscious Entrepreneur because I think there's a lot of emphasis these days on being an entrepreneur to make money, to have a lot of followers, to you know, basically develop yourself and have a following. But what about something else? What about elevating yourself? That's what this talk is about. So when I got started back in 1996, 1995, I started making bold statements. And I made a statement like this. If I had my way, having to hold for a customer service rep would be eliminated for good, researching a company's products would take minutes, and they could be purchased with a few clicks, and within five years, we're gonna use the internet for instant calculations, quotes, to chat on the fly. So show of hands, how many people think this was the year 2005? 2003? 2000? What year do you think it was? 99, 98. Okay, so this was in 1996. This was really early. And when I was making these bold statements, people were telling me, you know, you're out of your mind. You know, this thing, the internet's a fad. It's going to come and go. No one will ever, it'll never replace the idea of coming into a store, talking with somebody face to face, having a physical experience. That'll never be replaced. Now we can't imagine doing that when we can get our jobs and our work done on the internet. How about this one? Websites are becoming more than just a novelty. They may replace the telephone for purchasing products and finding what you're looking for. In the next five years, the internet will be not only established standard, but it will really function as the way that we conduct business. And that was in 97. And this is kind of a philosophical aspect because my degree when I was in college was in English and philosophy and huge emphasis on philosophy. I didn't get any business degree at all, no marketing degree, no entrepreneurship college. Those really didn't exist in the mid-90s. So I was really into philosophy, into the search for truth, into elevating consciousness, into awareness, self-awareness, mindfulness. And I really saw the internet early on as a way to have this shared connectedness, this shared consciousness. And when you think about things like Twitter, it's really a worldwide conversation, right? It's things that are happening all the time. They're flowing. Uh, that, at the end of the day, is what the internet really allows us to do. I mean, every human being on planet Earth can be connected using a smartphone device. So if you start to think about what that means, that means that everybody's uh, psychology is connected. Everyone's consciousness is connected. Everyone's good days and bad days are connected. Is that so hard to believe that there's going to be a transcendence between the device you carry around, this supercomputer, and whatever you're feeling, whatever's going on in your mind? I don't think so. I think those things are going to become very invisible and very connected. And uh, I started seeing that, you know, in, in 1999. I, I mean, it was amazing, right? You get on, on a little computer there and you're accessing information from 10,000 miles away. How fascinating, right? It's amazing. So my encouragement to you, step one, to be an entrepreneur, to even have a successful life, is you start making bold statements. Don't worry about what other people think. You know, in fact, maybe you should be uh, making statements that might offend people some, from time to time or might freak them out or might, they might think they're totally out of your mind. This is what change makers do. This is what leadership requires. The other thing, and I actually led a, a high school entrepreneurship camp here at City College, and we, we met up with a lot of uh, young entrepreneurs that were between the ages of 14 and 18, and we developed uh, their ideas. We helped them to sort of look at the best practices of how they could take their concepts and really bring them to fruition. And it's at that time that I started to see this trend economically that entrepreneurs and startups will be the key to America's economic resurgence. And that was back in uh, January 2006, 10 years ago. So what are the conventional definitions of success? Well, you've got making lots of money. You know, people here want to make money. Anybody here? Some of you, okay. Some of you want fame. You know, I teach a mar marketing class here and I, I always ask at the beginning of class what you're looking to get out of the class and about half of my students this year told me that they want to develop themselves as an icon on the internet. They want to have a following. So this is part of their definition of success. Fair enough. 
and power. You know, uh, being able to, what does that mean exactly? What does power exactly mean? It means having unlimited choices maybe, a lot of freedom to make decisions, to do things. So those are the conventional definitions of success. But what about the conscious entrepreneur's definition of success? I think it's things like happiness. I mean, really truly being happy. What if that was the goal? What if it was that simple? Now, you may be thinking, well, that's, that's a lot easier than making a lot of money, Jacques. Anybody can be happy. Well, I, I don't know about that. And money does not translate to happiness. In fact, after about $70,000, which is a relatively low amount of money when you think about it, it's very achievable. Everybody here will make that if they want to. You're all living in an affluent community. You're getting a good education. You're surrounded by a great network. People at the Career Center will help you. You'll make that money. After that $70,000, your happiness marginally increases. So if you make 70 or half a million a year, it's about the same level of happiness. So money's not going to really change happiness. So that's one definition of success that people don't think about. How about confidence? How about feeling good in your body and with your thoughts and with where you are, feeling purpose-driven? Wouldn't that be a great definition of success? Wouldn't that be a great way to go through life? How about integrity? You know, a wise man once said that integrity is what you do and what you say when no one else is watching, you know? How you behave when you can get away with something when you can cheat, when, when you can lie. And at, at this level, when I talk about integrity, it will affect every aspect of your life. It'll affect your, your friendships, your, your lover, romance relationships, your business engagements. Integrity is something that is not taught in class. You don't, there's no integrity 101, right? Parents teach that, mentors teach that, but it's sometimes overlooked and sometimes an easy corner to cut. And it's absolutely a definition of success and it will become a greater definition. This is my bold prediction, right? I made bold predictions in the mid-90s. I'm telling you guys, in the next few years, these will become the definitions of success. This is how you will measure success. And health. What a novel idea, right, to really be healthy. How many wealthy people do you know that let their health go, are in such distress, such anxiety that you know, they're losing their hair early, they're, you know, unable to go to work very much, they're unable to enjoy their wealth, they can't really even go for a walk. There's a lot of people like that. They sacrifice their health for the conventional definitions of success. So my first recommendations to you is to start examining these four aspects of yourself and ask yourself, how am I at these levels? If from a zero to 10, am I a 10 out of 10 in health? Am I an eight out of 10 in integrity? Am I a four out of 10 in confidence, happiness? These are very easy things to measure, right? There's no class for this, but it's incredibly important. So I want you guys to think about that after today. I want that to be part of the way you define your own success. Every day, ask yourself if these things are being accomplished. I cannot stress enough that a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of very wealthy people, they're not concerned about these things until it's too late. So make this a priority now. Does anybody here know what temet noske means? And if you're in my class, you don't get to answer. Anybody? Nobody knows? Okay, we're gonna get a little help from uh, the Matrix. So, what do you think? Do you think you are the one? Honestly, I don't know. You know what that means? It's Latin means know thyself. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Being the one is just like being in love. No one can tell you you're in love. You just know it through and through, balls to bones. Know thyself. This is absolutely the most important aspect of being a successful entrepreneur. And most people go through life having no clue. They're programmed at a young age. They follow the footsteps that their parents want them to follow or their friends want them to follow. There's a very little waking life going on. And I hate to say it, but a lot of people in college are exactly like that. Not none of you, of course. You guys are super aware. So I'm gonna tell you the entrepreneur's definition of knowing thyself and how it applies to specific decisions you're gonna make when you start your business, 
when you launch your business, when you grow your business. And as I do this, I want to talk about capacity. How many people have taken a road trip? Everybody's here taking a road trip. Who has not taken a road trip? Great. You have not never taken a road trip? No. We've got to go somewhere. <laughs> Should go to Big Sur. All right. I like that. We'll bike somewhere. Yeah. Okay. So if you're going to take a road trip, uh, how many people have taken a road trip with a, uh, a fuel gauge in your car that doesn't work? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Amazing. There's always a couple people that raise their hand. Okay, so that's awesome um, and scary. So it's, 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 kind of, it's kind of crazy to take a road trip with a car whose fuel gauge doesn't work because you really don't know when you're going to run out of fuel, right? So you're driving along the highway and you've got to time it based on how many miles you've gone and where the next gas station is. It's kind of, it's kind of earth shatteringly annoying, right? And we've got this little device that tells us that when we're getting to empty, and some of our cars actually say, hey, you've got seven miles left. You know, I'm like the guy that wants to know, is zero really zero? Like I get it down and I'm like, oh, I got another 17 miles after zero. So I know zero is not really zero. <laughs> but at the end of the day, uh, it would be crazy to take a road trip knowing, unless you had to, that your vehicle cannot tell you when you're going to need more fuel. And yet, everybody, not everybody, a lot of people go through life exactly like that. A lot of people go through life without understanding of their capacity, without understanding what their fuel level is. And that's what knowing yourself is about. So I learned that lesson the hard way when I started my first business, I was about 21. At the University of Michigan, I was starting to sell very high-end web development, very high-end websites. This was the mid-90s. There were not a lot of people doing this. So you, know, you could basically call the shots in terms of how much you charged and uh, you, know, you were in high demand. I met a guy at a networking event who was very well connected in the automotive industry. This is in Michigan. The automotive industry is like the film industry in LA. It's the big industry. And he was going to make introductions for me with all the buyers, all the people that could write me a $250,000 check to build them a website. It would have cost me about $8,000 to build a $250,000 website. That's the math back then, just to think about that. And I was like, great, this is the guy I'm going to get to know. I'm going to build a friendship with him, a partnership with him. He's my man. So we set up a lunch meeting. We met on a Thursday. We set up a lunch meeting for that following Wednesday. And that morning, I went into the office. And as I did, I, I got really busy with stuff. I had a lot of meetings. 11.30 came around. I'm like still dealing with some emails, some phone calls. I'm, there's no way I'm going to get to where he is. He's 20 miles away on time by noon. So I call him up. I say, hey, uh, Ken. Ken, I'm not going to make the meeting. I'd like to reschedule with you. Is that a, is that a problem? Is, 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 is concerned about that? He's like, OK, Jacques. No, no that's fine. We'll reschedule. We'll reschedule our lunch. Uh, how about Friday? So I said, perfect. Friday will be perfect. I looked at my calendar. I had nothing scheduled on Friday morning. No way I'm going to be late. Everything's going to be just fine on Friday. Good. Thank you, Ken. Friday comes around. Nothing on the schedule. Everything's cool. Get in my car at 11 o'clock to get to his place by noon. It takes a while in, in Detroit area to, to drive anywhere. And I had no, no fuel. My capacity was really low, and I didn't plan on this, so I went to the gas station, and there were some issues at the gas station. The credit card machine wasn't working right. There was a long line. It took like 20 minutes to get gas. Usually, it takes five minutes. So I was like starting to run on tight on time, right? And I, I get on the road, get on the highway, and then I hit traffic 10 miles in. Traffic's getting heavier and heavier, and I'm like looking at the clock. It's 11:56. I'm supposed to be there in four minutes. I start to panic. Cell phones are very heavy, so I use both hands at this time. This is the mid 90s. I picked up the phone. I said, "Hey, it's six dollars a minute. Hey, I'm running late. Um, can I? Uh, can, can I? Can we be? I'll be there at like 12:15, 12:20." Um, I left him a voicemail because I couldn't get to him. And uh, I assume he gets the voicemail, everything's going to be good. I get there about 12.20. I walk up to the office manager. I say, hi, I'm Jacques. I'm here for my meeting with Ken. She says, I'm so sorry. Ken has left for a lunch appointment with one of his colleagues. Oh, yeah, he, he was waiting for you, though. He waited for 15 minutes, and then he left. I was really bummed. I missed the meeting again. Two times in a row, it's not like me. How did this happen? I'm not giving him the impression I want to give him. This is no good, but I'm going to make it up. I'm charming. I'm a smooth talker. I'll call him up this afternoon. I'll work it out. So I call him up. I get him on the phone. I say, Ken, you wouldn't believe what happened. I went to the gas station. The credit card machine didn't work. There was a long line. Then I hit the traffic of traffic. I never thought I hit traffic. There was an accident. I didn't expect it. You know, I showed up. I was 20 minutes late. You had already left. I apologize. Please let me make it up to you. You name the time and place. I'll be there next week. I will not be late. I'll be 20 minutes early. 
And he said, Jacques, I'm so sorry. I, mean, I can't schedule another appointment with you. And I said, why? Why wouldn't you schedule another appointment with me? I just explained to you that it was out of my control. I did what I had to do. He said, well, I, I now see that your capacity, this is when I first learned about capacity, is such that if I schedule another appointment with you, there'll be a 33% chance of success. And I said, 33% chance of success? What are you talking about? And, and he said, Jacques, I don't schedule appointments with people where there's not at least a 70, 80% chance. Why would I fill my calendar scheduling appointments with people if it's not going to be a 70 to 80% chance of success? What kind of life would that be? What, what kind of businessman would I be if I scheduled things if there's one third chance of success? Well, how are you figuring that, Ken? Well, Jacques, let's see. If you show up, if we schedule another meeting and you show up and you make it on time, that will mean that you will have been successful 33% of the time. That's one out of three scheduled appointments. And so it was at that moment that I started to see the world at a quantitative level, right? At a very data level. It was like numbers. And this is how this guy thought about everything. And I, at first I was so offended, right? I was so offended because I was sincere that I wanted to work with this guy and I was going to bust my butt and I was going to get my team focused on his projects and we were going to do great quality work. But he was dismissing me based on what? A quantification? But I realized that he was simply making a capacity decision. And it was not about his capa my capacity, it was about his capacity. He would not have a meeting with somebody if there was a 33% chance of success. And you know what, I don't blame him because I don't win either. Would you guys have a meeting with somebody? Would you have a schedule with something if there was a one in three chance it would work out? Right, because you respect your own time, right? Yeah, so that's what this guy did, he taught me that. So knowing yourself is about knowing your capacity, your strengths, your weaknesses, maybe more your weaknesses than anything else. Being very honest with yourself, taking that ego away, not worrying about the consequences of realizing you're not good at something or you, don't, you need more time to do something. This is what is called elevating your consciousness. So let's go through the formula. Here we have my buddy Bradley Cooper from the movie Limitless. Who's seen Limitless? Okay, great. You saw it then. Does anyone want, who hasn't seen it? All right, quick little synopsis. Uh, this guy's kind of down and out writer. He can't get his life together. His girlfriend breaks, breaks up with him. He lives in an apartment about this big. He's, you know, he's, he's, he's down and out. You know, he's, his life is not together. He's like constantly in his head. He's drinking at 11 o'clock every day. A nice enough guy, capable, well-educated guy. But he's just kind of going in circles, going in circles, right? And then this guy, is, uh, his former wife's um, brother, runs into him on the street. And he says, listen, I've, I've come across this... Uh, drug, this designer drug, it's got no negative consequences, what do you tell him? You just take this drug and you, you can use all of your brain, right? You're not using 10% or 15%, you're using 100%. And so he starts taking this, this pill that he's holding there called NZT and, and life starts to incredibly improve, right, in every aspect. But when you think about what's really going on with this guy in the movie, when you really examine the movie, when you watch the movie carefully, what this guy's doing as a result of this drug, maybe he's accessing more parts of his brain, fine, I'll give it to him. But what's really happening is that he's completely immersed in the moment. He is completely immersed, he is so present. He is so present. So all of you right now can actually be as good as the NZT Bradley Cooper version of Limitless. All you gotta do is be present. Now easier said than done, because even in this room, while you guys are listening to me talk, there are things entering your mind. There are thoughts, there are issues, things that happened earlier today. Did I, why did I yell at that person today? Why did they yell at me? What do I have to do tomorrow? What am I having for dinner? I don't like the feeling of this chair. I don't like that guy talking. I mean, whatever's going on in your mind, these are not, you know, these are things that are just popping up. They're little things firing. So, formula for success in life and in business, be present. Because these, these moments, these seconds, these minutes that are passing are yours. And I'll tell you what, I don't care what's going on in technology, I'm on the forefront. I'm looking at the latest in virtual reality and wearable biotech technology. I'm looking at like the stuff they'll put in that'll take the cancer cells out of your body. I can't think of anything right now that will legitimately create more time. Time is the one commodity that I, I don't see the scientists and the technologists and the engineers finding, or maybe they'll find a solution to this, but I think time is pretty limited. There's a clock ticking down. So my question for you all is why would you go through life being somewhere else and not consuming the moment? It's almost like you buy this $100 dinner 
and you're eating it, but at the same time you're putting other things in your mouth, like a $3 burger at the same time that you're eating this lobster or whatever. You know, why would you do that? You wouldn't do that, right? You'd want to taste every succulent texture and flavor out of that $100 meal. Well, that's how passing through life, second by second, presently, is. You're consuming life for what it is. So, if you're wondering how to be more present, if you struggle with being present, I'm going to give you two tips, right? Here's one. Now, we're always breathing, but some of us are aware of it and some of us aren't. And so, we want to check yourself, come back to your breath. It's really simple. This isn't yoga class. This is life, right? I guarantee if you take a breath, your brain starts to slow down. You become a lot more present. So just take some deep breaths. There's, there's no reason. There's no, you can be silent. You're in the middle of a conversation. <sighs> yeah, I'm present again. It's all good. That's easy. Just try it. Next time you start mind wandering and freaking out, take a breath. Okay, number two. Trust your senses. Here are your senses, right? Right now, you're feeling something supporting your butt and your back. You're hearing a guy's voice. You're hearing the, the vent blow air. There's a certain temperature in the room, right? That's what's happening. You see me animated moving around. You see these screens. That's it. Now pretend that that's all there is because that's all there is. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't other things. There's things going on at your apartment and at your work and uh, with your family and on the other side of the world. But in this present moment, that's all that is, right? So one, breathe, take some deep breaths. Whenever you're mind wandering or having a little bit of anxiety, see how easy it is? It's like, it's like seriously free medicine. And then trust your senses. Now, why is this so important, right? Because business isn't that complicated. Now, again, I can teach you, and, and the teachers and great professors here can teach you about the mechanics of marketing, about financials, about business models, about strategy. We can teach you that stuff. But if you're not present, your meetings are going to be pretty weak. You're going to get 30-40% out of that meeting. Your engagements and your conversations with your partners and your colleagues are going to be pretty diluted. There's going to be a lower level of trust, a lower level of investment, and you won't even know it. And so I'm telling you, if you tie presence to everything you're doing, the value will go up. Okay, practice synchronicity. You see this? This is the police. Yeah, I, so I, I'm like coordinated with my, it's the police. This is the uh, synchronicity album. And this is my t-shirt, police. It's the best band ever. Okay, the synchronicity album is not the definition of synchronicity that I want to share with you today. But I wanted you guys to see that it's a great album. You might want to download it. You've heard some of the songs. Roxanne, Every Breath You Take, good songs, good music. Synchronicity is also known as a meaningful coincidence. Hmm, interesting. Not the definition. When your thoughts, your words, and your actions are aligned. Now let that kind of rest with you, right? What kind of synchronicity exists in your life? Uh, I think congruence is when multiple points reach the same apex. But it's good thinking. It's similar. I would say synchronicity is when you know you're feeling something and you're thinking something and you communicate, you find a way. I mean, brilliant, powerful people, one thing they have in common is they find a way to express how they feel, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's going to create anxiety, even if it's going to turn into an argument eventually. Hopefully it doesn't, but they find a way to express how they feel. They live in synchronicity. The other thing that great business people do, really simple concept that unfortunately most people are amateurs, especially in business, they simply do what they say they're going to do. What a novel idea. Hey, I'm going to be there at that time. Okay, not half an hour late, not early, at that time. I'm going to be there at that time. I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to send you that email by 6 o'clock. Not 6.07, by 6 o'clock. Now, if, if you're listening to this and you're wondering, you're thinking like, this guy, come on, tell me something I need to, how am I going to make a lot of money? I want to be a great entrepreneur. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, if you simply align your thoughts and your words and your actions, you will be successful. It is so rare. 
It is so rare. Practice synchronicity. Set intentions. Now, if you got the first two figured out, you're going to be able to do number three real easy, right? If you're present and you're in synchronicity, it's going to be real easy to know what your intention is. So I can come here tonight and I can say, hey, Ed, uh, we got to be here. It's uh, four o'clock because I'm talking at the career center. And then uh, at five o'clock, we can take a break. And then six o'clock, I teach class. And then at eight o'clock, we're having sushi. You know, I, this is my schedule, right? That's got nothing to do with intention. Intention is, what do I want to accomplish from four to five o'clock, right? What's going to happen? What to me is the outcome? What's the goal? So I'm not here to deliver these slides and these words. I'm here to like impact you guys. So my intention tonight is to really cause an effect. That's my intention. I said it before I walked in. I said it when I designed these slides, when I prepared this talk, that's my intention. Every meeting should be like that. Every class you go to should be like that. I tell my students, hey, you're not there for the professors, right? The professors are there for you. So use that time. Your parents or you are spending money for the professor's time. So if the, you want to know something, use their time. That's, they're there for their expertise and knowledge. Ask them questions. Interrupt them. It's okay. If they don't answer you during class, email them. Get them to help you. Set intentions. Get something out of, you know, know what you want to get out of these meetings. I, 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 there's certain situations, most situations, I will not have a meeting unless someone tells me what we're doing. Why are we having a meeting? Just so the four of us can talk about a few ideas? Okay, so that's a brainstorming session, maybe. All right, but let's, let's try to set some real intentions. What are we going to try to get to by the end of the meeting? Or else, why are you wasting your time? Why would you have the meeting with that person? Set intentions, and then you'll know what your actions are to achieve your goals. Fourth, surround yourself. Surround yourself with friends, mentors, people who will tell you what's up. You know, there's nothing worse than surrounding yourself with people who tell you what you want to hear, who placate you. You're not going to grow as a person. You need to surround yourself with people who are going to, sometimes they're going to hurt your feelings. Honestly, that's not the end of the world. That means they're, they're, they're honest, they're authentic, they're transparent. So surround yourself with the right people. This is when you're going to really grow. This is Michael Jordan. I don't know if you guys are into Kobe Bryant, LeBron James. This is who I grew up with, right? This is the basketball player of my era. Michael Jordan says that he's missed more than 9,000 shots, lost 300 games, 26 times he was trusted to take the game-winning shot, and it missed. And it's all these failures why he succeeds in life. And that's exactly what business is like. People get really scared about failing. Just redefine the word failure. It is not a bad word. Failure just means you figure out a way that it won't work. And you might need to do that a hundred times before you figure out the way that it works. So just go into it prepared to, ah, we had the wrong customer in mind. Oh, we had the wrong language the way we spoke to these customers. Oh, we, we marketed on Facebook. We should have gone with Instagram. Oh, you know, we didn't spend enough money on this. That's okay. These are failures, iterative failures. Now, I'm, if you're failing and you're not learning, then, then we have a different problem. But failing in and of itself is a really good thing. It's a really good thing. So you have to find a way to have the courage and the fearlessness to fail. And then you become legendary, like this guy. So another practice that you can start doing effective immediately is to reflect on your day. Think about social interactions that you've had that day. Try to watch those interactions as if there was a third camera, a third party camera floating. And by the way, we're not too far away from this. Within three years, there's gonna be drone cameras that literally you throw up in the air and they just follow you around. And when they run out of juice, they go to the sun, they get some more sun, and then they follow you around. And they play music within five feet of where the wristband that you're wearing until we have a, an implant. So just, isn't that gonna be, that's gonna be pretty cool, right? <laughs> no. Yeah, it's gonna, it's gonna be pretty cool. It's called, uh, the camera's called Lily. You should check it out. They're, they're working on it. There's a few kinks, but uh, it's pretty amazing technology. So now, in the meantime, start to imagine what it's like to be that third camera. What would you look like in that third camera? Are you coming off kind of rude, kind of offensive, kind of unreasonable? Uh, are you coming off timid? Are you not getting your point across? Are you not really telling the person what you really feel? See yourself objectively like you're watching a movie. And, and, and reflect on that and adjust it the next time. It's okay to talk to yourself, despite what other people say about insanity. 
I think the most normal people are actually doing a lot of like, you know, talk to yourself. Say good things, say bad things, but have a bit of a relationship with yourself. So as you start to figure out what you're really good at, what really inspires you, what really is passionate for you, start tracking how much of your day you spend doing it. I'm going to show you technology in a few minutes that helps you do this, but for now, kind of keep, keep sense of it. I bet there's going to be a direct correlation to playing on your strengths and to spending time every day on things that you're passionate and good at with how happy, confident, integrity, and what was the fourth one? Sorry? Health and how healthy you feel. Exactly. There are some consequences, by the way, of not knowing yourself. You can ignore me or fall asleep like this guy, and you basically will have some consequences. You'll have a capacity problem. You'll constantly make promises you don't keep. If that's the way you want to go through life, that's okay. Maybe you want to go through life 60% of the way. You know what? I make 60% of my promises, I keep them. Who wants to say that? Who wants to say that? Is that good enough for you? I want to be like 90 plus or 98 plus, right? You'll have a capacity problem if you don't know yourself. You're going to have a lot of unnecessary conflicts because you're not communicating. You're going to live other people's lives, your parents' lives, uh, uh, some friend's life, people that you think are cool that you want to impress. Yeah, it won't be your own life. Bummer. And the worst thing, and I've seen this happen a lot, is that you're actually going to have the success, the conventional definition of success, the money, the power, the fame. But guess what? You won't be happy. You won't feel fulfilled. You won't be living your purpose. You'll feel sluggish. You'll feel weak. You'll be unclear. There are some benefits to knowing yourself. First of all, you're going to know exactly what role you need to play in an organization. This is critical. You may not be the leader of your own organization. You may have the idea and you may be willing to put some money into it, but you may not be the right person to lead it. And you'll only know you're not the right person to lead it if you know yourself. You'll spend more time on your strengths than your weaknesses, which is what we just talked about. And you're going to surround yourself with the right management team. This is incredibly important. Like, I have partners in one of my business in First Click, the online marketing agency, that are far better than me and will always be better than me at certain things. They're more patient than I am. They're more people-oriented than I am. And it brings them joy to deal with these things that bring me despair. But I can only figure that out if I go through the self-examination. So you're going to live a much happier, more purpose-driven life as a result of knowing yourself. So let's start figuring out how you are, okay? Most people in business break down to task-oriented and people-oriented. Later on, if I don't get to this, ask me how I can tell whose task and whose people right when I walk into their office or into their apartment, okay? There are some tricks. Task-oriented people make lists. People-oriented oriented people have a lot of meetings. They want to be interacting with humans, right? The task-oriented people are constantly, who's making lists all the time? You're probably task-oriented. You can be both, but it's unusual. Task-oriented take personal action, right? They're like very like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get things done. I'm going to create a plan. I'm going to go through X, Y, and Z, right? The people-oriented people are team builders. They look at who's on their team and they execute with a group. Task-oriented set deadlines. The people-oriented ask others how long things will take. Are you starting to see I'm very task-oriented, right? I tell the engineers, can I have this on Friday? I want this on Friday. Can I have this on Friday? I'm going to plan on this on Friday. Whereas a people-oriented person would say, hey, before I set the schedule, can you tell me how long this takes? Oh, it takes an extra three days. Okay, got it. So next Tuesday. <laughs> See what I'm saying? So which one are you? And you got to know which one are you in order to put yourself in the right place on the bus or in the organization. The task-oriented people likes to be in control of the entire process, and they want to monitor it. The people-oriented people are looking and checking in on feelings. Feelings are important to them. They're not important to me. This is not a bad thing. It's not that I want to offend anyone. It's that I want to get the thing done, right? And so I'm expecting compartmentalization. So I have partners that are concerned about feelings, and I trust them to deal with that. Does that make sense? Okay. I hope I'm not typecasting myself. All right. Task-oriented are on a need-to-know basis, right? And people-oriented are like, every, uh, literally the other day, someone came into my office and they're like, oh, I heard this happened. And I thought to myself, like, that just happened like nine minutes ago. How did you hear that happened? That has nothing to do with your entire world of universe. But there are some people in the office that like to share everything that's going on with everybody else. 
You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Those are people oriented. There's two kinds of people in an organization, managers and leaders. I'm going to go fast because I don't want to, I want to leave a little time for questions. The managers take care of where you are. They're operators. They deal with the current day-to-day -day problems. The leaders take you to a brand new place. They're the visionaries. The managers are dealing with complex issues. The leaders deal with the unpredictable stuff, the uncertainty. The managers want to find the facts. The leaders want to make decisions. Seeing a trend? Managers are concerned about doing things right. The leaders are concerned with doing the right thing. Okay, so I'm building this house right now, and it's really nice. And there's this stone pillar, right? It's a beautiful pillar, and it's like all made out of stone. And this one part of the stone pillar, there's this little like divot that, that for some reason is there. And I was like looking at it, and I'm thinking like, why do they do that? Because all you have to do is cut the stair back and make the stone square look perfect, right? So I tell these guys, the carpenter, the stone guy, the wood guy, the floor guy, hey, can we get it squared up? And they're like, yeah. We can do that. If that's what you want, no problem. And, and I was in the house that day, in and out, and I watched them do it. And there's no way in a million years I could have ever done it. I mean, I watched what they did. It wasn't that complicated, right? They had like a saw, and they were chipping stone, and the guy was picking up. I couldn't do it. I knew it needed to be done. I knew that that had to be squared off. But I, I couldn't do it. You see, a leader isn't above a manager. They're not above. They're equal. You need both. I want to emphasize that. The manager finds answers and solutions, and the leaders are figuring out what questions to ask all the time. So let me give you another technique, and we are wrapping up soon. Pacing. This is from uh, a relatively new philosophical context in business and in friendships and in love. And it has to do with examining your pacing. Now, each of you can do this with your roommates, with your friends, with your family. Everybody's got a pace from 0 to 100. It changes a little bit in life, but it pretty, pretty much the, stays a very close variability. Einstein had a very, very slow pace. Albert Einstein had a 35 out of 100. So if you were having a conversation with Einstein, he would probably be speaking a little slower and controlled and process and observe and the pace would be slower and he would see all the parts and how they connect obviously at levels that very few humans ever saw but he wouldn't pace up like this he, he just doesn't know how to do that that's not his style right it's the way it works in life is that you want to find people and find a way to pace with people at the same pace. And if you're trying to communicate something and you're at a 75, like I'm at a 75 usually, and I'm trying to talk to somebody who's at a 35, it's going to fail. If I keep it at 75, they're going to get 30% of what I want them to do and then I'm going to be annoyed that only 30% got done. But it's because they're processing information differently than I'm delivering it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this is the case with love, with friendships, and absolutely in business. If you want to get things accomplished, figure out the pace of the person you're speaking to or the people in your team. There's an aggregate. There's an average of the people in the team. And figure that out. Start examining that. But you've got to know your own pace first. You've got to know yourself. You've got to know kind of where you're at, where your temperament is. Pacing is awesome. I just learned this in the last six months. It's such an amazing thing. Now I'm learning how you can figure out somebody's pace literally by how they present themselves, their face, their clothing, their eyes. It's awesome. It's really cool. Really interesting. I think of uh, this time in your life, most of you and even those that are coming back to school right now, as an amazing time to fill your computer hardware and software and develop yourself, right? You got, I, I'm serious, I, here's another bold statement, okay? I think it's just a matter of time before we realize we are literally a machine. We're a very sophisticated machine that has something, maybe a soul, maybe a heart element, but there's so much machine in us, right? The physical machine, the mental machine, the software capacity, the processing power, just like a computer, right? So this education you're getting right now, 
this is the time in your life. This is the time to fill it up. Fill it up. Hopefully you'll keep doing this forever. But take advantage of this time, right? Become a sponge. It gets a lot harder later in life. You know, when you've got a nine to five, when you've got kids, when you've got like other responsibilities. These are real responsibilities you have right now, but there's going to get other ones that are going to become like life or death ones. And then it's like, okay, it's more about them and keeping them alive. I've got an infant, whatever it is, than it is about me learning and becoming a more advanced human. So this is your opportunity. You should be stoked, right? You should be like thinking all every morning. You should be like, oh, this is sponge time. This is my time. So I took this to another level. Um, I realized that the average person is sending 34 emails a day and receiving 106. We use our smartphone for 245 minutes a day. All sorts of stuff, right? Um, we're in seven, on average, seven physical locations every day. We're 88 texts. This is my quantified mind. I'm showing my quantified, right? Remember the capacity, numbers? These are all things that are happening. But what if we collected all the data, everything that happens in our lives, every single day, every single hour, and it was somehow quantified? Would it be helpful to us? I think it would. We have this smartphone that can act as the, um, the data acquisition tool, right? If you program it right and if you use it the right way. And then we can aggregate it against algorithms, psychological algorithms and health algorithms. And maybe, just maybe, the smartphone could actually tell us what a therapist, a mother, and a best friend would tell us all the time. And so the company that I started three years ago called Self Echo does exactly that. It's a smartphone app that's capturing your emotional sentiment passively without you doing anything and actively, aggregating information based on true research-based psychology and providing you with insights on yourself, who you spend your time with, your activities, and how you live your life. And if you're interested in this, we're going to be soon releasing a version of consumers. Right now it's only available through therapy, through clinical psychologists who are actually helping people deal with depression, stress, anxiety, PTSD, marital conflicts. But we are about to launch a version for everybody, the consumer. So if you're interested, you can use it. So it's five o'clock and I'm, uh, I'm available if we don't get your question in or you know, at any time, uh, all these mechanisms, I will respond to you, I promise. Um, these are like my social media things that I'm pretty active on. Uh, yeah, I'm on Facebook. I don't post that often, right? I don't post that often, like once every couple weeks. And uh, thank you for your time. Appreciate it.